Hey, my name is Alex and welcome to the tutorial where I'm going to give you a full breakdown of a recent project I created for our site Pixel Preacher where we make creative content for churches where they can edit and use inside of their services. So this is a Christmas uh, sort of a sacred stained glass feel project where we used a ton of programs from Illustrator, Photoshop, After Effects, uh, Cinema 4D and Redshift to create this entire thing. So we're going to do a full breakdown of how we made it. So let's jump in. So the end goal for this project was to make a customized stained glass uh, image that would be able to tell the nativity story and the whole reason we celebrate Christmas um, but in order to do that we have to draw it in Illustrator and then drag it into Cinema 4D extrude all of those shapes and, and make our, our glass panels. So the first goal was to get into Illustrator and draw what our actual window and a full screen would look like. And this was my first pass. So we had uh, some various images that would um, be a part of the entire uh, story that we're gonna tell in these corners, as well as our main sort of central uh, image with the manger on the very bottom. Uh, so it turned out okay. It looked pretty cool as we got into it. Um, and I started applying the textures in Cinema 4D and it just was, it was looking a little too uh, circusy and cartoony with these uh, these sun rays going on in the background um, because they were various colors and it, it looked too outdated and kind of circusy. So I did some more research on how to make this look visually appealing. So I came across this image of an actual stained glass and it just looked uh, really, really captivating. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but this one just had tons of these pieces in here and it, it really caught my attention early on. And that, that's what I wanted to convey in the final project. Um, doing this I knew was going to be a lot of work as far as Cinema 4D goes but I just thought this is going to be worth it at the very end and I think it turned out pretty well but it looks so much better than than this um, you know sun rays kind of vibe going on this one just looked a lot more glorious and, and epic so that was what we wanted to accomplish so first let's talk about Illustrator and the steps you need to do in order to make this work inside of Cinema 4D so let's go ahead and jump in Illustrator all right so I've opened up my main project in Illustrator and this is most of it I'm missing the corners and the border but this will show you um, some of the pieces that I, I did I had to kind of break it apart into various um, files for Illustrator mainly because I didn't really know what I was doing. It was a lot of trial and error, but we finally got there. So um, the biggest thing was to make pretty much everything a shape. And this took uh, this took a, a long, long time to get in here and uh, do all this. So I kind of had to draw these by hand. I believe I would start with one and then I would draw it. Um, you know, I kind of make my shapes first and then um, have to get them, you know, rather, rather close. And I probably could have overlapped them a little bit in hindsight, but um, you know, I wanted to make it just look like a bunch of kind of shattered pieces of glass almost. Um, so this was, uh, again, took a long time, but we'll, we'll go from start to finish a little bit. So I'm gonna just open up a new project. And the big thing with this is to actually, uh, we'll just make it 1920 by 1080. The big thing was to organize it in a certain way for uh, Cinema 4D to read it the right way. So, um, you know, we can make really anything here. We'll just use this as an example. So we'll do uh, something very simple. So I'm gonna click on my square tool and we'll just add some sort of color to this and we'll turn off our stroke on that. We'll keep things as clean as we can. So we'll do just like a, a blue color. And again, the colors don't matter on this. So we're gonna make a blue color here. And uh, now we wanna do, we're just gonna do like a circle in the middle with like a star inside that circle. So um, the thing you don't want to do is have images uh, or layers overlap inside of Illustrator. So I'm gonna draw uh, maybe another circle in here something like this and we'll maybe move that up somewhere in the center and we'll change this color a little bit all right close enough and now we need to subtract the circle from the main rectangle the next thing i want to do is duplicate my circle so i'm going to hold down the option key and click and drag it up to there and that's good now i want to cut out the circle let me turn off that new one we have i want to cut out the circle from the rectangle so in order to do that i typically highlight them both and I use my Pathfinder um, little toolbar here or, or panel and I click on I believe this this one here to exclude that and now we have a rectangle without the circle in the middle which is good I'm gonna turn my circle back on my the original and let's change the color so we can just differentiate what we're looking at here so let's do like an orange okay so that's good to go so far uh, so now we want to add our uh, star in there. So let's grab a go to the circle tool and we're going to go to the star tool And again, if you're going to draw an actual shape You may need to use a pen tool or something like that to draw something very custom What I did for like the hands and the stars I would bring in a hand image um, For that, you know found on the internet and I would trace that out using the pen tool or the brush tool to get uh, smooth lines and then you know turn that into 
Illustrator layers. All right, so I have my star tool selected. I'm just gonna click and drag when I hold down shift to keep it nice and straight. There we go. And we'll go and change our color just to keep up with everything. And I'm just gonna drag that somewhere here. Now again, we need to make sure that we remove the star from the circle so that again, that everything has its own layer. Uh, so I'm gonna duplicate that circle one more time just so I have a copy of it. And I also need to duplicate my star so I have a copy of that because once I do where I exclude the two, then I will lose those. So I'm gonna click on uh, the star and my lips tool or my lips shape and I'm gonna do the exclude button. I can turn off that star. So now we have, we have our main shape which is the square rectangle in the background. We have our um, circle without the star. Then we have our star by itself, which now we can change that color. Turn that back on. We'll do like a red. All right, so you can make it as complicated or as simple as you want, but this is, we'll just go with this for now. All right, so the next thing we wanna do is break all of these little pieces up into their own uh, layers. So I'm going to make a new layer, make actually a few layers here. And we'll put our star up here, and I'll call this star. We'll drag this one up here and call this uh, circle. I don't think we need this ellipse anymore, so I'm just gonna delete that. And we have our background. So we really have three elements. We have our main square, we have the circle, and then we have the star inside of this. I'm just gonna drag the star up here. Or the background, so we'll call this, uh, call this background. All right, so these other two layers we can delete. We don't need those anymore. And I believe that's all we need to do as far as the structure goes. But if you have a bunch of different layers, then I believe that you know once you drag it into Cinema 4D, it'll, it'll organize it based on how you organize it. So again, you definitely want them all as your separate layers because those will be how you apply different materials, but then you can even go farther and break those down into various groups, um, such as like this crown. And then, uh, you know, then you have a few more options there. So in this one, I had a bunch of spaces in between. I really don't think that's totally necessary as I was able to, uh, you know, I don't want any gaps in between them and I was kind of struggling to get that to work. Um, but I, th I think we'll, we'll try it with this for now and see what happens and if we need to make some changes, we will. So let's go ahead and save this and we wanna make this an actual um, Illustrator 8 file, I believe. So I'm going to just save this somewhere in my uh, Christmas 2021 Illustrator file. And we'll call this uh, Sample Illustrator and I hit save and it'll ask me um, a few options here. And I believe, I think 2020 worked, but I, th I think you'll have a better um, result if you use Illustrator 8, but you can try different things out. All right, hit okay and hit okay. And so now we can jump into Cinema 4D and plug this in. All right, so Cinema 4D is open. This is R25, which I'm super new to, so I may be a little slow around this interface, but we'll do our, our best to get through it. Um, so before, before we do anything, uh, we need to install a free plugin that is super helpful, that uh, was a godsend for this project that I, I didn't know about until now. And that is uh, ArtSmart. So if you go to somewhere on the internet and you Google, uh, Cineversity, and we'll actually just Google Art Smart as well. That should pull up this uh, Cineversity page here where you have Art Smart to download and install, and you're welcome to watch the video on this. But basically, it takes your layers from Illustrator and breaks them into pieces uh, nice and organized for you. So it's super helpful, and it's free, and it's awesome. So um, definitely use that if you're going to be using something like this or have a lot of complex layers. Um, so mine is up here. I think you want to install it, you have to go to extensions and CV Art Smart, and I'm gonna do the Art Smart object. So that's gonna bring up this little um, object here, and now we can drop in our file. The old way I would do it would be to drag in my Illustrator file, it would break that up into splines, and I'd have to extrude all those objects, but this does it sort of all for you, which is really nice. So I'm gonna click on the Art Smart object, I'm gonna go down to this little tab here where I can uh, add my file. So I'm gonna click this little button, and we're gonna go and find our file. Let's see what we call a sample project right here. And boom, there it is. So it drops it in already extruded for you. So I'm gonna zoom back out so you can see. And it even brings in our colors as well, um, which we don't really need those, but at least now we can see what we're working with. Okay, so uh, you have a few options over here. We have uh, you know, some various offset things and path spread. I'm gonna make all these zero because I want them to be pretty flat, like a pane of glass. But if you adjust those, it sort of moves them apart. 
Um, we'll keep them flat for now. Then your extrude depth is obviously how thick your glass is going to be. We're going to keep that pretty small, like 20 millimeters. And what's cool with this is you can use, you know, um, like some random effectors and things like that, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but this is sort of the base of it. I'm going to go ahead and change my view to my my Redshift setup. So I have a, just a, a sort of a user setup for Redshift with my viewer down here and my materials down here. Very similar to some of the older Cinema 4D versions, but all this should work if you're using even an older version. Um, so inside of ArtSmart, you can go to uh, the Create Materials button. So if you click on that, it'll make these little materials. I'm actually not even going to use those at all either, so I can just delete those to be honest. Um, but I think it, when you do that, it sort of breaks down your um, your various layers that we created inside of Illustrator. So we have background, circle, and star. So if I open up the background, we have the path, which is where we can add um, the, our materials here. And you can add, you know, specific depth and, and offset to those. All right. So the next thing to do is to start with making the actual glass material. Now, when this project, I actually started using uh, some of Grayscale Gorilla's um, everyday materials collection, I believe, um, just to get my base. And they have a really nice with their the node based materials. They have a really nice build out to where you can start playing around with different options. Um, I'm not great with starting from scratch on node based materials, but um, the way they have it set up is super helpful and they have some imperfections you can add and all kinds of stuff. So definitely check them out um, if you haven't already. Um, but this is sort of, you know, really nice, realistic looking stuff that you can do inside of it. So, um, but we'll try to build it from scratch just in case you don't have access to that. All right. So the first thing we want to do is go to create and hopefully have Redshift. I'm going to be using Redshift for this. I'm going to go to materials and we're just going to make a material um, right there. And we can double click on that. That's going to bring up our node editor, which is always a bit intimidating for me. And that's why it's really great to have um, the Grayscale Gorilla stuff as a starting point. So the first thing we're going to add is a texture. So I'm going to type in texture over here and we're going to drag this over. Uh, they have, you know, I used um, some imperfection type stuff from uh, Grayscale, but you can add any sort of texture you want, find like a grungy type texture. But theirs is nice and seamless, which is nice. But, um, you know, feel free to add your own. So the one they have is this uh, sort of a smudged glass look. Um, again, I think really any texture would work, but I'm gonna hit, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and select their smudged glass stuff right here. So I'm gonna click on that and it's gonna load it into there. And I think all this stuff should stay the same, but we may toy with those in a bit. So now we need to make a uh, color layer, I believe. So I'm gonna type in color layer. And this is sort of like almost like a small Photoshop um, based layer system. So the next thing we'll do is take the out color. We're actually going to pipe this into the reflection uh, roughness, I believe here. All right. And now we're going to take our RS texture, which is that um, sort of a smudgy glass look, and we're going to drag it and put it into the base color. All right. And so for the RS material, I think we kill all of our uh, diffuse colors. We don't need any of that. And our reflection color will stay there. And I believe this uh, refraction color will go to maybe one. I think we can change this to really whatever color. So we'll make it like a, a this deep, maybe bluish green color. And hit OK. And so now you can see our refraction and transmission, which way it's pulling the light in, is um, bumped all the way up. And we have a nice color in there. So that'll, that'll really drive our main uh, color of our glass. Now, before we go any farther on the material and tweaking and fine tuning, let's see what this actually is looking like on an actual object. So I'm going to minimize this. And to apply a texture or a material to your um, image, you can go to, again, your ArtSmart layer. And we're going to go to our background, which is where we were. And we want to add this um, to this yellow back here. So I'm going to click and drag it. I'm going to put it on the extrusion, which is this guy right here. And so now it's going to be nice and black, which makes it hard to understand what's going on. But uh, if I turn this on, this is my uh, IPR window for Redshift. So I'm going to click on that and it should render it out. You can't see anything because I don't have any light in here. So let's add some light. So the way that I lit this scene was to go to Redshift and then go to uh, Lights and Dome Light. And here is you can create, you can add an HDR image to your dome light and it'll light that whole scene. This definitely took some trial and error because I would try various lights and it just wouldn't quite uh, work very well. So I'd go to compositing, which is where my folder is. I have a bunch of HDR images in here. So let's just throw like a studio in here and see what happens. So let's click on this one here. And these are just HDR images. Uh, HDRI Haven is a great place to find um, some HDR images. So as I move around, you can sort of see it's it's um, transparent. You can see some edges there. Um, but this one just wasn't quite working. And this is not going to be a good representation because we haven't added any texture to our glass yet. 
Um, but what I actually used was a outdoor uh, light from uh, HDR Haven, I believe. So let's see, it was one of these warm courtyard night images, I, I think. Uh, let's see if I can toggle this down and find which one it was. Uh, I found an image that was um, really, had a lot of uh, night lighting um, in like a small town square. Um, and then I had to add a little bit of blur to it. So this is sort of a rough um, look of, it's like super blurry in the background. But then what I had to do was I took that HDR image into um, Photoshop and I added um, all sorts of, uh, basically clone stamped the mess out of one of the um, uh, lighting areas inside of that image. And so you can sort of see it back there. You have like a street, um, some big buildings that are really lit up, but then I just covered it in all these little speckled lights, which um, I think worked out pretty well. So uh, let's rotate that just so I can see it in the background. Click on my dome light and rotate it to where. It's all those copied images. And then I believe I drop that saturation a pretty good bit. Okay, so now we can sort of see what our glass is doing a little bit there. So let's go back to the material and work on making this a little bit better. So I think the next thing to do to make it really look um, like a old school glass is to add a bump map to it. And so in order to do that, I'm gonna click up here in the search bar, type in bump, and we're gonna drag in bump map. And I'm gonna pipe this into the overall bump input right there, okay? And now we need to add a noise layer. So I think I just used the max on noise option right here. Drag that down in here. And we're gonna pump that into, into the input. And so now you can see our glass has all sorts of things going on. So it uh, it's really looking like a bubbly type of glass. So let's go to max on noise and we're gonna change some settings in here. So I think what I used was gaseous and that gets a panel like that. But the problem is this noise is way too small, so we need to bump up the size to it. So we're gonna make our scale, let's type in like five. All right, so that's getting somewhere. Um, so maybe we can tone down the amount of it a little bit. So I think in order to do that, we'll go to the bump map uh, node right there, and we'll drop down this scale maybe to like 0.5, and let's see what happens. All right, so now we're getting uh, somewhere there. Um, let's uh, let's bump it up even more. Let's see what happens as we go bigger. I think maybe smaller might be the way to go, somewhere around in there. It's still a little too clear, um, but we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. So play around with the height field and the scale on, on what you want to do as far as the look goes. But uh, all these things create just a lot of cool um, various glass type looks that just can create some really nice stuff. So um, definitely play around with that and see what you come up with. But I went with gaseous, I think, for this, and it's nice and bubbly and. Um, kind of like a tempered looking weird glass. Okay, so um, now let's pump in some textures to this glass. And that's where our color layer comes into uh, play, where it's sort of like, a, again, Photoshop layers. So we're gonna add a few different grunge type of layers. And again, uh, using a seamless texture is ideal, but you can probably drag in anything and it'll work fine. But I'm gonna use some of those grayscale um, textures in order to make this work. All right, so we'll make a new texture. Drag this in here. And here I can put in my new uh, texture so I can uh, type in, find that texture that I was using, which is this number 44, I believe. So I'm gonna click on that. That's got a bunch of like speckled type looks to it. Okay, and you can also take that texture to see what it actually is doing um, by adding a, uh, go to tools and connect node to output. I've made a uh, personal, uh, keyboard shortcut for it. So I click on my texture and do shift control C and it'll connect it straight to that so I can see sort of how this glass look or the scratch texture looks on top of uh, this glass. So that size looks fairly decent. Um, one thing I'm gonna also do is add a ramp node to this. So I'm gonna type in ramp and I'll drag in ramp and we will bridge the gap here. Okay, and so now with this ramp, I can sort of control you know, the, the level of brightness for those scratches, or I can really tighten it down to get just a few scratches there. Um, so that's a good way to uh, adjust those. Okay, so we obviously don't want to connect it to the output, so I'm gonna click on my Redshift material and connect that back. And I'm gonna go to ramp, and I'm gonna put this in uh, layer one color. All right, and so now I want to take that color layer and do a blending mode. Here's my layer, and I, I can kind of ignore all this, I believe, and just change this to add. Okay, 
And so now we're just gonna really do the same thing, but maybe with another texture. Um, so I'm gonna click on these two options here. I can click and highlight. I'm gonna copy and paste, drag these down. And I'm gonna plug this into layer color number two. And leave will also change, we'll enable that. Also change that to add. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is do the RS material and change our roughness. Uh, so this is just looking too clean. So we're gonna bump this to 0.25. So let's zoom in a little bit on these colors and see uh, what this glass is looking like here. Get nice and close to this glass so we can see some imperfections and things in there. So at this point we should be seeing some uh, different um, scratches and things. So let's go ahead and play around with some of that. So the scratches are there. I'm going to maybe make that a little bit smaller. So we'll go to the texture. Let me bump this down a little bit. All right, so I gotta figure out where I have misstepped here, and I think I need to plug in the, uh, check my material here. Um, my wrap, my reflections is not really, um, my scratches and things aren't really going through, so I think my problem is I need to uh, double check this. So I'm gonna go, let's see where this is plugged into. I wanna make sure I'm in the um, reflection. So I think I was stuck on reflection roughness here under the refraction, but I need to go under the reflection and then select reflection roughness and there we go now we're getting to where we have uh, a little bit more of a scratched look there uh, so now we're, we're on to something okay so let's start tweaking some things um, all this is fine all right so the next thing I want to click is under my material I want to make sure I turn off this link to reflection uh, so if I click off that then I should be able to control some more of the roughness of my glass uh, so I'm gonna bump this roughness up a little bit and now we can get a little bit more of a rough looking glass there. Because I don't really want to know what's behind the glass. I just want to rough it up a little bit. And we also bumped up our reflection. So, you know, you're getting this uh, nice bounce off of the glass of what's in front of the glass. So you may want to reduce that just a little bit. But add some nice uh, some realism and some color to it. So now we're getting somewhere. That's feeling, that's feeling pretty good. So if I sort of navigate around here, this glass is looking pretty cool. So... Now you can go in and maybe change some of these textures around so those scratches could be a little bit big so you can go into your texture. Uh, let's see if our scratch texture here, maybe general. Scale this down some. And this is really that that comes into handy so I can do shift uh, command C to see how big these scratches are. Uh, and these are pretty big so I'm gonna go to my texture and we're gonna bump this, we'll go to three. For some reason when you go scale it up it gets smaller but you know, whatever. Um, all right, so let's see what that looks like. It's looking a little little better there. So overall, that is sort of the gist of it um, with making that, that that glass texture. So now what we can do is take uh, our, our main texture here, um, which is right here, and I'm going to copy and paste a new one. So we'll call this uh, blue, drag this over here. Um, can I rename that? We'll call this blue. And if I double click here, we will call this, uh, let's go with the yellow. All right, so now we can apply the yellow texture to our, um, we'll go with the actual uh, circle. So I'm gonna go to the circle tab and we want to uh, toggle down to path and now add that to the extrusion right there. So that should turn blue, yeah, that's still blue. So now we double click on that and we're gonna go to our shader graph. And again, all the color is gonna be controlled with um, the refraction tab. So we're gonna go to the bluish color and we're gonna make this kind of a yellowy. It's gotta be almost white to give it like a yellow tint. You know, something like that. All right, so we'll click off of that and we'll take a look. Let's get a little closer to that star. So now we can see that right there. So the next step is to get that nice um, kind of that seam where, where stained glass is kind of welded together, I guess. Um, so in order to do that, we need to add some caps to our object. So I'm gonna go back to that Art Smart object. And if you go to caps, you can change this here. So I think I'm gonna put my size up to like, I think I, maybe it was like 20 uh, millimeters. And we can uh, maybe bump the so now you can see we have a little bit of an outline in here. So I'm going to zoom in some. And I tell you, the R25 um, 
cap look is uh, not my favorite compared to the old one, so I'm still trying to get used to it. Um, but I think you can maybe do bevel outside. Mm, let's see. So let's go ahead and create a material for that. I'm just going to go create new uh, redshift materials, and we'll do like a metal maybe look. Let's double click on that. And we can change our preset to, we'll just go to like a, let's go to like a lead color. And that should make a relatively close look to lead. Uh, it takes a little while for a redshift to update for some reason, but that's okay. So now what we can do is go to the layers and we'll go down to that circle, which we're under, and we can add it to this um, round tab here. So I'm gonna click and drag that right there. And now it should apply. Yeah, you can see it applied to that uh, look right there. We'll also apply it to really everything. Our, our um, outline for all the glass will be the same, so we can apply that same texture to all of those round pieces. So that's the background. We have our, and we'll add it to the star as well. Okay. All right, so now we have a little bit of a round cap on that. That's looking pretty close. So now let's get rid of this red star. Let's duplicate our layer. And we'll just, I don't know what color we want this. Let's do orange, I don't know. Let's do a green. Double click on that. And under our material, we'll go to that refraction and we'll do some sort of, maybe a greenish blue. It'll be a little bit lighter than that dark blue that we have. So we'll go with that. And I can click and drag that, oops, to my, Uh, exterior color star right there boom all right boom there we go so that's looking more like some glass going on so as far as the caps go I feel like the closest setting I can get for sort of that um, that seam is changing my size to pretty small and then uh, bumping up the shape depth a pretty good bit and then increasing my segments and changing this bevel outside so the all these settings are totally different in newer versions um, but that's about the, the closest I can get to that, um, you know, extruded sort of look. But you can, you get the idea right there from that, that view. So as I zoom out, you can see now we have our nice glass, whoop, our nice pane of glass with some really nice reflections in there. Um, even that reflection off the front is pretty cool look. So um, you can get a really lot of a cool looks if you take your dome light and do, just kind of rotate it a little bit. Um, it just changes it completely. Uh, so you maybe want to try a few different, um, you know, backgrounds uh, for your HDR image in order to get some cool looks. So that's just a nice, really nice, realistic look. So so we can take it a step further and add some random effectors and different MoGraph effectors to the glass to create some cool looks. This obviously helps if you have a lot of pieces. So for instance, this loop right here, um, I was able to add a random effector to all the little um, groups that we had made. So the glass is sort of moving back and forth, um, which makes a pretty cool look. Now it was a bit um, render intensive as far as just computing power and, and things like that, but uh, it turned out to be pretty cool. But all you would do is go to the uh, smart object and you will now go to the object tab and go to use MoGraph. And now you can add a random effector. So if I go to uh, my, let's see, where is it? MoGraph tab and effector and random. And then I believe I need to add it to here. So layer effector, drag my random onto here. And now it randomizes that shape. Um, it's also pretty thin, so let's make a nice thick piece of glass, and so we'll change this to like 100. So now we have some thickness in there on our glass, which looks pretty cool. Um, but your effector will go and change all that, so we'll go to our parameter. I'll just knock all this back to zero. We can turn on the rotation and the scale. Um, I can take that rotation and just kind of you know, randomize all of those images. So you can make some pretty cool uh, animations with that just to add a little bit more of a interesting uh, piece. You can then add separate effectors to those actual layers. So you can drag in an effector just for the background by dragging right there, or just for the star and things like that. So, so there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with it. Um, just be careful, and I think what you can do is also update the um, 
uh, Illustrator file, and then it you know you can reload it. But just I feel like I've I've done that before, and just my textures would kind of get wonky. So just be careful when doing that. Um, play around with that before you get too deep into the project. So. All right, and so for the animation, I would just add uh, a camera to the scene. So I would click on, I uh, actually go to Redshift and do Redshift camera here, standard. Uh, then I turn my camera on, and now I can get a nice side angle, and we'll add some. You, know, you can add depth. I, I did my depth in After Effects by making a, um, a depth pass, but you can do it. You know, you can bake it into your um, your Cinema 4D file by turning on your bokeh there under your Redshift settings, and I think I turned this to none. Now it gets super blurry, so I can go to my camera settings, change my focus distance to like somewhere closer to, I want to set my derive from camera to focus distance, and I can bump up that power. And so now, it's really focused right in front of me, so I can change my focus distance by doing it here under camera object, and I'll rack focus to, uh, to the star wherever I choose. But this gives you a little less control, but so typically I would um, actually turn all that off and I would make a um, depth pass inside of Cinema 4D or under Redshift. So I'd go to Redshift AOV Manager and add a depth pass here. Click on that. Change this from, uh, let's see, Z to Z normalized. And typically what I would do to figure out what my depth is, um, would be to use again, uh, you know, figure out what these little numbers should be right here. I would use my focus distance. So the closest my focus should be is going to be somewhere around. So I would click my little focus distance um, dropper there. And here's the, the corner is closest to the camera. So that's going to be somewhere around, you know, 3390. And mine is set to, I'm just going to do like 3000 set to millimeters for some reason, but I'll change that later. Uh, then I can pick the farthest away, which is going to be that top right corner, which is 12, 4, 27. So 12, 4, 20, we'll say 12, 4, 50. Give a little bit of wiggle room there. Okay, and so now just to make sure that my depth pass is looking right, you can change this um, beauty pass to depth and then do bucket render, and it should render out what your depth pass would look like. All right, so I changed my units back to centimeters, and that seems to work much better. So now I have a sort of a, a darker to lighter depth map, which would work well for this. So this that's exactly what you want. You want to make sure you have some sort of value between black and white um, for your depth pass. So um, that's what you. If I had extruded shapes, then I would see what you know where those are in this space. But mine is all pretty flat for now, so you can't really see any of that. But that's fine. That's generally what you want. Okay, so I would yeah, I would not bake my depth in, and I would um, save that out as a separate pass. So as long as you have that set inside of here, then you'd be good to go. Just make sure you go to your render settings, and uh, under your multi-pass, just change that to, um, you know, turn that on somewhere. So I would just do a simple camera animation. I won't get into all that. Um, just setting some key frames from a, from a, you know, point A to point B. Um, you know, based on however long it needs to be, I would save it out as a JPEG sequence. Um, and then I'd also have that depth pass saved in there as a JPEG sequence as well. Um, save that all to the same folder, um, have my output set, and uh, hit render. So that's, uh, that's about it. So before we move on, let me just show you the actual project uh, once it was all said and done inside of Cinema 4D before we move on to Photoshop and things. So uh, this is the, the main uh, stained glass that I ended up with. Um, so this took, it took a long time to get all of these textures on there. There's no really easy way, um, let me see if I can find it, to, to go in there and, um, you know, quick copy and paste all those textures. I literally had to drag each one, uh, one at a time into their various uh, layer panels. So if I click on layers here, so the big part was all of the little pieces on the outside. Uh, it was broken into like 34 segments, and then inside of those segments were even more segments. So for instance, taking number 24, um, inside of here had, you know, I don't know, 15 paths. So what I did is I just made a whole, once I got my, my glass texture, I made a whole bunch of copies of that and just tweaked the color. And I wanted to make a rainbow type gradient. So with every color, um, I would have, you know, three shades of that color. So yellow, there may be, you know, three to five shades. Blue has about, you know, three to four. Um, you know, purple even had a few sh uh, shades, green. So I just made a, a long gradient of a rainbow and then started dragging those one by one. So the closer to the circle, I used uh, lighter yellowy colors. And then as I got farther out, I would make my way down this entire, um, 
uh, gradient and going from you know yellow to orange to red to green to blue to, to purple um, to create sort of a, a burst look. And that clicking and dragging all of those textures back and forth probably took me a day and a half just to do that. So uh, it took quite some time. And with all these little pieces, it takes a lot more computer power, so it would be a little slower. Um, but the final output was uh, pretty cool, I think. A lot better than my circus weird old school sunburst look. Um, but if I click on the preview render, we'll just take a look at it and play around with um, what it looks like. All right, so the initial um, load in of this window just takes a little bit of time because that's to process all these colors. But uh, you can see as I move around, all the lights happening in the background, which is nice. Um, so if I zoom in a little bit, I don't want those lights bleeding through. But it just makes for a really nice look to that glass. So just some nice subtle animations there um, really made it pay off. Um, and I also love that front reflection on some of this glass. It kind of has a dirty, dusty feel. So if I zoom in maybe to the star some, you can see. It just looks really grungy and old, and I kind of dig it. So from here, I would, you know, I would find my angle, and then I would take that dome light and just start, start moving it around. Um, you can't really move it position-wise, but you can just rotate it all around your scene. And you get these nice, like, pops of color inside of your stained glass. I believe I may have added a few camera effects. Let's see, camera, redshift. I may have added some, some bloom um, to that, so it kind of, any sort of light touching or, or looking at the camera gives it sort of a glow um, feel to it. But I think it was just bloom maybe on that. A touch of streak. Not think I enabled that or disabled that, but yeah, adding a bloom just gives the the camera a little bit more of a realistic feel. Um, but that's that's how it was. I don't have a random effector on this particular scene, um, but you can play around with that and and, random, and randomize all your little pieces. So if you're watching this tutorial just for how to make a glass look inside of Cinema 4D, the stained glass vibe. Um, then that's kind of the end of it. I'm gonna go into Photoshop and talk about the color correction and some various overlays and things I did there and then jump into After Effects a little bit to talk about the final animation. So um, if that's it for you, thanks a bunch, but if you wanna learn more, let's keep watching. So let's go jump into uh, Photoshop. All right, so inside Photoshop, this is sort of the document that we would uh, give to our customers, but I will walk you through how I got this look um, based on the uh, some color correction. So I'm gonna open up a new document and we'll do 1920 by 1080. So I'm gonna drag in um, a full rendered shot uh, similar to this um, that is not colored. So I'm gonna just go File and Place, and let's find a shot of that. So Cinema 4D, Renders, Stills. So this is what the image looked like without any sort of color correction, which, you know, inside of Cinema 4D, like, oh, that looks pretty good, and looks, looks nice and uh, colorful, but it, it lacked just a little bit more of a cinematic vibe, so I wanted to add some color correction to it uh, in order to get that really kind of dark, uh, really cool color palette, I think. So um, let's talk about what I did. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my main document just so I can remember exactly what I did, and I'm gonna drag in some color corrections, but the first thing I did, I believe, was add just a few overlay textures and these are really just basic let's just throw those in there real quick here and we're going to throw those onto our old so a lot of times i would find some uh, some random images here scale this down a good bit and these are just some like uh, overlay you know random uh, particles and things uh, so I would do like a soft light on those and then bump that, maybe that opacity way, way down. Just kind of makes a little more contrast to that. This one's set to linear dodge, um, which again is nothing too fancy, just kind of a, a bokeh type of overlay. It's obviously way too big. Something like that. Set that to linear dodge. And, and I don't know... You know, I, I'm not going to drag a material in here and know right away what it should be. Um, I just, I click through those and play with them until I get something that I like. So this just had a, a few little, almost like imperfections um, onto the glass. All right, so then I probably added a selective color. So we're going to go to our color correction. I'm just going to duplicate this over to that as well. 
And so this is where the, the magic happens inside of this color correction uh, folder. So let's start one by one. And there's a lot going on here, so we're just gonna turn all this off. Um, so for me, I added um, a hue and saturation and dropped that uh, hue and saturation pretty far down to negative 46. I think that's all I did there. Added a selective color. And inside of here, I played around, I mainly play around with a lot of the, just like the neutrals. Uh, and then um, some of the black values there. I don't think I really played with much else. Um, but that can add, that can really do a lot. I, I'm a sucker for um, selective color. And that is found under adjustments. Click on selective color and then you can go in and start really tweaking some of these values and it, it just does uh, wonders for some of your images. So I would just play around with until I got to somewhere that I liked. And then I would add, you know, add on another. So that's, don't need that one anymore. So then I would do another pass with selective color, maybe tweak some of the um, various uh, values like the reds. So, so when you select different colors like the reds or the yellows, it will just be affecting just those red values, which is um, really nice. Again, same thing with like yellows, I would tweak those um, to get the right yellow that I wanted. Um, and again, I don't know what those yellows I wanted until I start playing around with it. Uh, so then I did another hue and saturation, which I probably played with some of the... So in here, I would just desaturate maybe just the blue. Um, and again, it's so very subtle, but you can see some of the purple values up there changing. Um, so I would just select my blues and then adjust those right there, as well as the magentas. Okay, uh, so then I go to the gradient map, and this is a sort of a green and red gradient map on top of it with a blending mode. Maybe I'll just drop the opacity down a little bit uh, to get some of those colors there. And then I didn't like how it dimmed this down, so I added the levels on top of that to really brighten these colors up. And then I did a clipping master where I was just affecting that main circle um, by adding, or adding a layer mask and then painting in just a white section there to get those colors. Then a curves layer that's also popping out some of those colors in that uh, white right there, as well as another curves layer to really make the color pop. Hue and saturation a little bit to, um, I think I killed some of those um, various values in different colors and another hue and saturation around the sides. So probably some of it's a little bit overkill, but uh, after I play around with it enough, I get so deep into it that I'm, I feel like I, I can't go back anymore. So um, I just wanted a nice, bright, vibrant color uh, for that for that look. So. That's about it as far as the colors go. Um, then there's some texture and grain on here. Uh, so let me throw that in here as well. And this is just uh, like a, a grainy texture as well as these like sort of sparkly little pieces. Um, that's all just some random, so I set that to color dodge, but you can see it's sort of just some random light particle textures. So almost feels like it just brings it alive a little bit. Um, then there's some grain in there, but it's it's pretty subtle. So I also uh, rendered out a few different angles of the glass. So you see down here, there's like a, a nice uh, wide shot of the glass there. And I had to do a little bit of Photoshop to make that work. But, um, you know, then another, another shot there of just, uh, you know, the full pane of glass that you can see the whole thing. Um, and then added pretty much the same color correction to it. So. Uh, that's how I got the color correction out of that. Other, other than that, we can go into After Effects a little bit and talk about some of the animation pieces. Okay, so inside After Effects, we will walk through just sort of the anatomy of one of the scenes. A lot of the scenes are all built sort of the same way. You know, you're, you have them just broken up into various scenes as the camera cuts to uh, different parts of the animation um, and then some ones with some text on top of it. So we'll just take a look at one scene and uh, just kind of go from start to finish on how we um, accomplish this look. So we'll take a look at this scene here, which is just a nice close-up, almost like a macro shot of this glass, um, which is actually a really close-up of this cross shot here. Um, but on this one, I use some of the effectors. Um, and when you're when you're wide and straight onto the glass, you can't really see that the glass is kind of extruding a little bit. Um, so you know, having these nice close-up shots, you can do that. And obviously, this is very surreal, and glass wouldn't really do this. But this glass is kind of moving a little bit. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. All right, so let's go and find that sequence. And what I would do is I would uh, render out an image sequence from Cinema 4D. Uh, so let's go into this front here. So here's my image sequence and it just breaks down every frame into a 
uh, an image and I'm recently on a new computer which I'm excited about but my old computer probably took uh, doing this in 4k took me about seven to eight minutes per frame uh, to render out my new ones um, uh, about cut that in half so I was pretty excited so it gives me this uh, image sequence here and then also that depth map that we talked about inside of Cinema 4D so I can create that um, nice depth look so we'll go and click on one of these I have imported JPEG sequence selected and that'll bring in that sequence there I'm gonna drag that down onto my comp button and now we have just our uh, image sequence right there okay and we're going to we'll just drag all this into a new folder and we'll call this sample and we'll import another um, image sequence and that'll be our depth map. You can click on any one of these and it'll recognize it as um, a depth pass. So now we can click and drag this down on top of that and we have our depth pass. So in order to use this, you would need a plugin. Uh, I think you can use the camera lens blur plugin for After Effects, but um, I don't like it as much as a third party plugin called Frischlift. So I'm gonna go new and do an adjustment layer and we'll call this uh, depth. And I'm going to go to uh, effect and I'm going to go to fresh lift and depth of field. And so for here, I want to say, all right, I want to keep normal blur, but my depth layer is actually my depth pass, which is right here. And now I can turn this depth pass off and it goes away. But now I can go back to my depth settings and I can bump up my radius to, let's say like 15. And now it gets really blurry. So it's got a nice look to it. And now you can select and now you can select using this little um, crosshair where you want the um, depth of field to be. So I'm gonna click on this little crosshair and let's say I want it really close, like right here. So everything here is gonna be in focus and it'll get more out of focus as you go uh, towards the back. And you can bump up your radius to even more if you want it to get even blurrier, uh, like a really shallow depth of field there. Um, and one thing you can do is also pre-compose your depth layer um, and then add maybe a levels to it or something like that to you know crush those colors a little bit more But for now you get the idea But I can change this to wherever I want so I can actually have it rack focus from one to the other by using that um, that fresh lift uh, plugin Okay, so we'll just stick it right there in the middle. This is a little out of focus and that's a little out of focus looks pretty good um, So that's how I'd add my depth and now we can add in some other effects the next thing I wanted was to have a little bit of some light rays coming through. I tried to do it inside of Cinema 4D, um, but it just wasn't it wasn't looking great. So um, I figured I'll just do a real subtle look inside of Cinema or inside of After Effects to create uh, some some light rays. So I think I just duplicated my main layer here, and I'm going to add an effect and blur and sharpen. I think I did a radial fast blur here, and I can bump up that amount a pretty good bit. I think I select brightest as well. So it's picking out the brightest colors and it's gonna blast those colors out, which is what we want. Um, that looks ridiculous right now, but let's change our little crosshair to the direction. So I think if I click low, it'll sort of point it up high, which is what I wanted kind of coming out of the glass. Um, this is obviously out of control. So I'm going to add a uh, another blur to it, just a uh, fast box blur to get some of those those edges off, off of there. Maybe a little bit more. And then I'm going to add an effect and go to color correction and add uh, levels. And then I'm going to crush it down a pretty good bit. Something like this. And this is taking a, a page right out of the uh, Andrew Kramer video copilot um, page. So I think somewhere around there. Okay, so that looks, that looks good. Now we can maybe hit, uh, click on that layer, hit T on the keyboard, maybe bump that down a little bit opacity wise. And we'll just play around with some of the blending modes. So I click on my layer um, and then do shift plus and minus to flip through the different um, blending modes. to See which one look the most realistic. I'm gonna click toggle switch to mode. So I'm on add right now, lighten, screen, Screen is probably where I'm gonna sit. So I'm gonna hit, hit screen and I'm gonna turn that um, way, way down to like 20%. And again, I want it like super, uh, super subtle. So I'm gonna click on that radio fast blur again. Click way down here, I'm trying to get it to go almost like straight up. So again, you can see some of these little beams popping out of here and even that feels too much to me. So I'll probably go down to like 12%. Um, really, really subtle. But as the camera moves, those little beams should uh, kind of move with the image. So. 
it creates, a, again, a real subtle. So I'm gonna turn it off. It almost just adds a little bit of atmosphere to that shot. I'd also use a little bit of particular just to add some particles in the, uh, in the air. I won't go through any of that. There's tons of particular tutorials out there. Now, as far as colors go, you can uh, import your Photoshop file directly into After Effects uh, and then open up that sequence and it will give you those adjustment layers that you set inside of uh, Photoshop inside of After Effects. There may be a few tweaks here and there, um, but it's super helpful. So I'm gonna go ahead and just paste in the ones that I had for my previous project to uh, save us some time. Um, so inside of here, I have my color correction number one and I have a hue and saturation and a uh, selective color on that. A bunch of different colors through the um, inside of the selective color, focusing on just those individual colors. So you can play around with your settings there um, and then the hue and saturation right there. Uh, and then I have another color correction of some selective color layers and a tint layer. So um, feel free to play with your setting based on your colors. Uh, but a lot of selective color, a lot of desaturation, um, maybe some curves in there, but that creates the look that I have here. This was a little bit dark. Um, I think what I did was also added uh, a layer on top of this. So I'll do a, a layer new solid. I would make like a warm light almost so. I would select something like a uh, nice warm color, something like this, and hit OK. And then I would draw a mask on that by hitting G on the keyboard and just kind of draw like a random glowy spot. Okay. And I'd hit M a few times on the keyboard with that layer selected, bump up my softness. And then I would do a blending mode on this layer to see if I could get a nice glow spot. And I believe I landed on classic color dodge and then I would dial that way back in my setting or my opacity. And so now you can see if I turn this off, it really makes that pop a uh, pretty good bit. So I could then maybe make a few of these and move them around to get some uh, accents on the various spots, like the little spot back there is nice. Uh, so it's kind of fun to play with. This scene doesn't really need it, but I would have a vignette on a lot of scenes. So in order to make that, I would go to new layer solid, do like a dark color, and then draw a circle by doing my um, mask tool, like this ellipse tool here. Once that layer is selected, I would double click that and it would make a circular mask around that. I would change my um, uh, mode to subtract. Hit M a few times to feather that out. So this one's already already a little too dark, um, but I would maybe add like a linear burn on that and then dial that color way back as well. Okay, so that just really helps your eyes focus on that center shot. Um, outside of that, maybe a little bit of grain. Uh, a good way to do that is good to go to new layer adjustment. Let's see, do a solid and we'll call this grain. And I would go to effect noise and grain and do add a noise layer. Bump that up to maybe like four or five percent. It's getting a little grainy in there. It's gonna be hard to see on your end, but I believe I would change that to maybe add or screen. And it just adds a little bit of a film vibe to it. So as far as the main scenes, that's about it um, for the animation. I'd, for the text, I would just make a text layer and we'll call this uh, sample project. I used an ivory mode, I believe was my, uh, or ivy mode. Um, do like a bold and we'll change that to zero. Not bold, light. Okay. It's obviously very hard to see on this uh, scene, which is why inside of Cinema 4D, I would, I would frame for knowing that there would be text on the screen. So I'd have a nice darker corner or something like that. Um, but if I wanted to animate this, I think I would just add a, um, I would think I added a mask on that. So I'd do like a square mask over that there. Soften that up by changing my mask feathering, hitting M on the keyboard a few times to get that setting. Bump that way up. Then you can animate that mask on. So I would click on the mask path, move my playhead to the very beginning. I want to take that mask path and basically close it in there. It's kind of hard to see because it's, uh, let's make it white. So I would just make that really small. And then as it time moves on, it cuts through there and you can see it sort of fading on. 
Then as that's also happening, I would probably add that fast box blur again. So blur and sharpen, fast box blur. And then my text would start off blurry, maybe a little bit like that. Set that keyframe. And if you ever wanna see all your keyframes on your layer, just hit U on the keyboard a couple times and anything that you've set will show up. So I bump that down to, I almost make my text like always a little bit blurry, like just a touch, never like super crisp. Um, and so now we have a uh, in focus text there. So it comes on a little bit blurry and as over time it cleans up. So I'd repeat that process for each scene and then I would add that to one main composition that was um, broken down into each of those scenes. Uh, so for instance, this render long here goes from each of these shots to all the various scenes that you see in the final animation. And before I even got into After Effects, I would find the music I wanted. I would take that music into Premiere and break it up into the uh, scenes that I wanted and the length I wanted and then cut to that. So that's super helpful. It makes it feel a little bit more um, all together. So. All right, so I think that about covers the entire project. If you have any questions on this, drop them on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook group. If you were learning about Cinema 4D and how to make stained glass, then um, hopefully you learned something. Uh, if you're interested in our projects, then check us out at pixelpreacher.net. Uh, download some stuff for your church, and we uh, hope it serves you well. We thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye.